Good morning, <laughs> everyone. So we may uh, start our morning session, and uh, the first speaker uh, is Andre Martinez Finkelstein uh, from uh, Belarus University and the University of Almeria with a talk uh, Ponce Leder Bu, Kippenhahn, and Sigur projective geometry matrices and orthogonal polynomials. So please, thank you. thank you very much. Can you hear me? First of all, I want to thank и организаторы, и вдохновители этой конференции. Это первая конференция после почти двух лет. И отлично. Правда, очень благодарен. Все усилия практически единственный, кто из-за рубежа смог приехать. So, for uh, our online audience, I really grateful to the organizer that I could come here. This place is awesome. I really recommend next time trying to visit it in person. I hope we'll have more conferences like that here. So this, this uh, talk is a little bit, so if you look at the first names, it looks a little bit off topic because the conference is about complex approximation and orthogonal polynomials and applications. I won't have complex approximation today, but I will talk about orthogonal polynomials and especially applications. So it's a bit a mixture of projective geometry of uh, linear algebra or matrix theory. And finally, as you go, it's the main representative of orthogonal polynomials. So it's a joint work with my colleagues from, from Baylor University, although the first paper on this subject was together with Barry Simon, as I'm featuring Barry Simon here. So the story starts in Russia. That's actually another motivation too. So this uh, nice gentleman, Jean-Victor Ponsolet, made a mistake of joining a Napoleon army to invade Russia and definitely what was made prisoner very soon. And he was sent to, to Saratov to be some camp and decided to bail out uh, his freedom using mathematics. He started to uh, keep a diary, mathematical diary and sending letters to the St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences with some results, hoping that he will be invited to St. Petersburg and out of a jail. It didn't work, uh, so he returned two years later to Paris and he wrote a book that became a real big breakthrough in projective geometry. He had a lot of beautiful results. One of the results is the following one. So it's in a simplified form. So imagine you have a circle and an ellipse inside. If, if the, it turns out that there is a triangle that is inscribed in the circle and circumscribed around the, uh, the ellipse, then there are infinitely many such triangles. And actually, infinitely many in the sense you can start with any point on the circle and write and, and draw this triangle, and it will have the same property. So any starting point on the circle works. This is a beautiful result, by the way. It's, uh, it's known normally as porism, porism in the sense that something either never happens or always happens, right? So in this case, if we have one, we have infinitely many, OK? So we, we will say that such an ellipse has the three Poncelet property, three in the sense, well, you have a, like a three-sided polygon that it's inscribed around. And uh, well, natural question is, are there like uh, n Poncelet uh, polygons with n higher? The answer is obviously yes, especially if you just think like concentric circle, then it's very easy to see. What about more complicated configurations. Many people contributed to it, even uh, Lebec has a paper on the subject. And the really important result was 1917 by Darbu. And actually apparently not so well known result, but it's very interesting. So Darbu considered much more, much deeper. Actually the, the person that probably um, considered the, the most, the deepest result in, the, in that sense. He says, well, if, okay, that's a conditional statement again, we have a close and convex curve here inside the unit disk, such that there is an n-sided polygon circumscribed uh, around the, this uh, curve, 
and inscribed in the in the circle and another condition c so the curve that you're seeing here it's part it's a connected component of a bigger logic curve it's an algebraic curve of class n minus one such that each diagonal that you draw is tangent to this curve okay but let's postpone about these words about class i will clarify a little bit later but right now we just think that we're drawing all diagonals and considering the curve that is tangent to all of them. So if I draw all diagonals here, do it many times, you start visualizing a certain curve. And his statement is basically in the same spirit as Ponsole that says, well, if it happened uh, once, then you can start from every po any point on the circle and you will have the same property. So all the diagonals will be tangent to this algebraic curve inside the, the circle, okay? Now that's a that's very interesting, complicated proof, okay? It's an alge algebraic geometry. Yes, so everything is a complicated algebraic geometry. My point of this talk is to show if you use orthogonal polynomials, everything becomes simpler in your life. Um, okay, so um, the, oh, sorry about that, I, I just wanted uh, it's too fast. He actually had an addendum to this theorem, which is very nice and uh, curious, that says, if in addition, the outer curve, the guys out here, is an ellipse, then this algebraic curve I was talking about, it splits in several ellipses, nested ellipses. It's uh, the package of ellipses. You can see it right here, right? By the way, this only happens if the outer curve is an ellipse. So you have an example here when one of the components is an ellipse, still, if you look all of the object right curve, it's not an ellipse. So it's, it's a really interesting, curious, and deep result. Okay, so the next stop, we move now to matrix theory. Actually, operator theory, but matrices are fine with us. It's a, it's a keep in hand theorem. So it deals with numerical range. So numerical range we can define. By the way, I don't know how in Russian would be numerical range. So what is numerical range? It's a field, a field value also. Uh, it is the following set on the complex plane. So you take all the vectors of uh, Euclidean norm 1, and you multiply your matrix on the right by the column, on the left by the row, you get a complex number, right? And then you plot all these numbers, and that's a set on the complex plane, right? Okay, so notice it's not less or equal than one, it's exactly one. However, what can you say about this set? Well, uh, first of all, for a two by two matrix, it's a simple exercise. It's an uh, elliptical disk. What I mean by that, it's an ellipse and everything inside, okay? That's the set, but for a two by two. In general, it's a convex set in compact set. It's a, in fact a theorem and not totally trivial, it's a Toplitz and Hausdorff theorem, okay? So it's always convex. Another result which is very easy to establish, you just think for a second, that the spectrum, the eigenvalues are always inside this uh, numerical range. That's why numerical range is interesting sometimes just to visualize or estimate the spectrum of a matrix. Obviously, everything extends to infinitely dimensional operators, right? But we work with matrices here, okay? Another result, which is again not difficult, is the following. If A is normal, right, in particular like unitary or Hermitian, then the numerical range is just the convex hull of its eigenvalue. So it's a polygon, okay? Uh, in particular, if the matrix is unitary, so all its eigenvalues are sitting on the unit circle, then it's exactly a polygon inscribed in the unit circle that you see, you're starting seeing the connection, right? And the theorem of Kippenhan, it's 1951, and again, it's not so widely known, but it's very nice. It says the following. If we take an n by n matrix and look at its numerical range, then its numerical range, it's a convex hull. Remember, it's always a convex set, right? It's a convex hull of an algebraic curve 
of class N, N matches the size of the matrix, whose foci are the eigenvalues of the matrix. Okay? Okay, I think it started, it was enough already. So we, we found class twice, and we found, just found the word foci. So I know what foci of an ellipse are, right? What about general algebraic curve? If you're like me that had no idea about that, so let's make like a short stop and discuss for a second very briefly what are these notions from algebraic geometry. I only leave like the very, very basic information here. Well, when we speak about real affine algebraic curve, it's just uh, a set on R2 or C2, depending on what you're looking at, given by a solution of a polynomial in two variables equals zero, right? Uh, this we will be considering real polynomials. That's why it's a real affine curve. Although we definitely, although it's real polynomial, we can consider x and y complex numbers, right? Now, the degree of the polynomial, total degree, it's what we call the order of the curve. Now, when we work in projective geometry, it means in particular we need to handle infinity, right? So and the, the easiest way to handle infinity, we homogenize or we do this projective completion of the polynomials. In other words, it's a very simple procedure. You just uh, replace each variable x and y by x time divided by z, y divided by z, multiply through by uh, x, uh, z par n, you get back a polynomial and three variables, right? So you can again consider now a polynomial three variables, again, real or complex, more natural consider than complex. And a very particular case of such a procedure is the, the polynomial degree one. That's what we call the projective line, okay? Now, in the projective line, it's a polynomial degree of order one, we see that can be written in this form where x, y, and z's are the coordinates in the, in the projective space, and a, b, and c are uh, the coefficients. But here you immediately see the duality, right? Because actually who is, who is the variable here? Who are the coefficients? You can consider as the triplet like A, B, and C as, again, coordinates, right? Or variables, but in a dual space, right? And here, this duality, it's very important. And uh, it's very easy to see that, in general, if we look at all the coefficients A, B, and C, as variables in the, in the dual uh, space of the lines that are tangent to your curve, it's again will be an algebraic curve in a dual space, right? And that's what is called the dual curve, okay? Okay, the next thing we have to define is the notion of, of a focus, right? Or a plural foci. Um, if you look at a typical projective geometry book, it will say, well, these are points. Uh, real points where straight lines from specific points at infinity intersect. And it's difficult to visualize, so I'm more complex analyst. The good thing is that when you work out, it's, uh, you get a very simple uh, recipe. So foci are just points, solutions of the following equation. So the, take the equation of the dual curve, replace one i and negative z, this complex negative, uh, the complex z's are the foci, okay? So that uh, makes it a less mysterious. And uh, the number of solutions of this equation is the class. Remember I was mentioning class of the curve, that's the number of foci. So all this definition come from this gentleman in uh, mid 19th century, Plucker, who introduced that, that definition. And uh, let's see, uh, start seeing connection with, uh, back to uh, Kip and Hunt. By the way, I promise to somebody, no proofs. There will be only one proof in my, this talk, obviously on, not on my theorem, but Kip and Hunt's theorem, because I think it's so elegant, it's so nice that we could teach our students. It's very simple. So you want to prove this, uh, this theorem that, that looks, well, algebraic curves and a uh, class N, and talking about foci, how can you do that? Well, the idea is very simple. You just split the matrix in its real parts and imaginary part. That's well, very simple, right? So you just, uh, this guy, you just take A plus A uh, uh, Hermitian uh, transpose over two, and the other, what is remaining here, both are Hermitian matrices. Now, simple calculations, 
So remember, you're looking at numerical uh, range, so you're multiplying this guy from uh, the left and from the right by x, you work out a little bit, you use that, this are Hermitian, and you see the following. If you take the largest eigenvalue of this guy, remember these eigenvalues are real, right? You take the largest one, and you draw the vertical line, it will be tangent to the numerical range of your original matrix, okay? So there's nothing at, first of all, it will definitely touch at the, at the eigenvalue, and then there is nothing else here, so it's a tangent. What you do next, you just take this matrix and multiply by a complex number of absolute value one. So you rotate the matrix, right? Once you do that, everything is rotating. It's like the plane is rotating. And it's very easy to calculate how this matrix is transformed when you just multiply by e power i phi, right? And you, this uh, straight line now takes this, this, uh, this is the equation of the straight line that everything rotated, which means that, well, you have the coefficients of your, of your straight line, which is cosine, sine, and the largest eigenvalue, right? So since it's an eigenvalue, you should satisfy this, this characteristic polynomial equation, right? So this actually an equation of what you found, it's an equation of a tangent, of all the tangents here. It means what you found basically is the equation of the dual curve because you found the, all the tangents. Okay, so this is a dual curve and it's very easy to see that it's algebraic curve of class N, degree N size of the matrix. But not only that, the next, the, the final trick is fantastic. You say, okay, let's find its foci. Remember the, the recipe? Replace this guy by one, this guy by I, and this is a negative z. So when you do that, you get determined a minus z i equals zero. These are the eigenvalues, right? The solution. So it's a very nice theorem. It's a really beautiful theorem. Okay, uh, what about the connection with Poncelle and the team? So the the it has it goes through a certain class of matrices. Actually, a class of uh, operators that was introduced. Um, I will show the the book where it's a. Uh, Okay, let me give you some quick definition. First of all, what we call contraction, it's any matrix with norm, like operator norm less or equal than one. That's the first thing. Uh, for instance, unitary matrices are contractions, definitely. The second definition is uh, what is a completely non-unitary contraction. It's essentially, it's a contraction, obviously, that ho has no invariant subspace where it is unitary. Equivalently, we can say it has no eigenvalues on the unit circle. Everything is inside. Okay, the defect index, by the way, it's how far are you from the unitary, right? It's a dimension of the range of this difference. And it was introduced in this book by Sekefal uh, Naj, Afoyas, Berkovici, and uh, their goal, essentially, they say it's an, in the preamble that they wanted to extend the theory, the spectral theory of like unitary matrices to this larger class that they, they wanted to study, okay? So it's, it's um, they give a lot of uh, justification why this class is important. They study the equivalence classes there where equivalence means that everything is the same up to unitary conjugation. And they in specifically study this class. All the matrices like one step before uh, uh, to becoming unitary. So it's a completely non-unitary contractions with defect index one. Well, there are some important representatives there, like shift uh, uh, operator is there, okay? Uh, and then it's easy to prove all eigenvalues are inside the unit disk, and uh, there were questions, like for instance, any arbitrary set in D can be spectrum of such a matrix, or does the spectrum determine the matrix or the class, equivalence class? In general, the answer is no, but here, people like Mirman, Gao, Wu, others, they studied this, they gave answer yes to the first question and to the second question also yes. And you'll see in a minute why this is so natural. So the, the whole uh, thing related to this matrices is, is the notion of uh, uh, compression and dilations. To go real quick, because I will be running out of time, uh, well, if you project the matrix to a smaller, essentially, from a point of view matrices, uh, the compression will be just 
uh, deleting rows and columns, making it project into a smaller subspace, and dilation would be adding rows and columns, essentially, right, to a larger space. And the rank of the dilation is the, just the difference of the dimensions, how many rows and columns you added, right? And there is a fact that uh, all rank one unitary dilation, so you had a matrix from the class S1, remember one step to be unitary, you add one row, one column, make it unitary, there is one parametric family, and this parameter is living in the unit circle. And uh, this is the result that connects with the previous work of Fonsole. So Meerman, Boris Meerman and Gawain Wu independently proved the following. If you look at the numerical range of your original matrix in the class Sn, it can be obtained as the intersection of the numerical ranges of all its unitary dilations. So you take a matrix, make unitary dilations, intersect all the, the <coughs> numerical ranges, you get the numerical range of this guy. Now, why it connects? Because here you have a convex set inside the unit disk. On the right, these are unitary, so these are polygons inscribed in a disk. So when you intersect all these polygons, you get a curve, which is exactly the Poncelle setup, okay? Okay, it's time to mention the last character here as you go. And uh, it enters through this notion of OPUC, or orthogonal polynomials on the unit circle. And they will play obviously a role here, otherwise I wouldn't be giving my talk. And uh, let me give very, very short introduction to OPUC for this audience. It's probably a disrespect, but I still have to give the notation. So obviously, the whole theory starts with Geronimus, Sigo, sure. The standard reference right now is this uh, book that started like a, a small paper that grew, like in three months became uh, more than 1,000 pages. And now Barry is uh, uh, preparing the second edition which will be probably much larger, right? Uh, so the starting point, you have a measure on the unit circle. You have a Hilbert space, L2, with this measure. And if you apply to standard monomials, 1, z, z squared, so on, the Gram-Schmidt process, you will get uh, polynomials, right? Orthonormal, or I will be more caring about monic polynomials, orthogonal polynomials on the unit circle. Now, about this polynomial, the main result, the center of the whole theory, is what is called the Ziegler recursion. That says that the next polynomial in the row can be written in terms of a combinations of the polynomial phi and phi and star. Now, I'm afraid that I forgot to define phi and star, but for this audience, it's not a capital sin. It's what's called the reverse polynomial. So essentially, imagine that we write a polynomial and now we write the coefficient backwards in the opposite order and conjugate, okay? So if you know the polynomial, you know it's reversed. If you know this additional parameter, then you can recover the next polynomial. And, and these parameters are so-called Verblonsky coefficient. And the, the main uh, theory is that obviously they determine the next polynomial, right, by Sega recursion, but you can also invert the recursion and if you know this guy, you can re recover the, the Verblonsky coefficient. So it's a bijection, actually, right? Um, also, you should observe the following. If you take the polynomial, divide by its reverse, what you get is something that's called the Blaschke product, a finite Blaschke product. And uh, well, a nice connection with Blaschke product, you, you can rewrite this reference relation as uh, this ratio of the next polynomial divided by the, this guy as Blaschke product, z times Blaschke product, again Blaschke product, minus this, this guy, right, this coefficient. Remember, this coefficient is inside the unit disk, absolute value is strictly less than one. Okay, so in particular, zeros of these polynomials are solutions of this uh, equation, Blaschke product equal lambda. Now, the next notion I need to use is para-orthogonal polynomials. What's a para-orthogonal? It's just you break the rules. You say, I don't no longer want to use alphas inside the disk. I will put it on the unit circle. I take lambda that on the unit circle, absolute value of 1, but I continue the recursion. I get a new polynomial. And uh, in this polynomial, again, you can rewrite this guy in this way. And you realize that now the solution of this equation has n plus 1 solution on the unit circle. So the zeros of these polynomials are on the unit circle. 
And that's what we call the paraorthogonal extensions of the zeros of the polynomial on the side. Now, the main character in this uh, theory, this, the same role that is played by Jacobi matrices for real polynomials, here is played by a so-called CMV matrix. You don't have to uh, look at the structure here. Essentially, the whole idea is that once you have the alphas, you can build this uh, uh, matrix, which is infinite, right? Well, one-sided infinite matrix. In general, it's a unitary operator in L2. But if you cut it here, you no longer get a unitary matrix unless you make uh, next alpha here equal absolute value 1. Because if you make it absolute value 1, this guy becomes 0. And you see it splits exactly into blocks of unitary blocks. But as long as it's not uh, 1, you get something that is not unitary, right? OK. This is what we call the cutoff CMV matrix. And this is the first, the starting point was this work with Barry Simon that we just built a dictionary translating all the previous results in, the, in terms of polynomials. And first of all, remember that class that Berkovici and people introduced as uh, completely non unitary contractions with defect index 1? Turns out that it's exactly, identically the same as the cutoff CMV matrices, or we can also call it compressed multiplication operators. One to one, right? So no mystery from a point of view, it's the most natural class of matrices to consider. Uh, also, uh, so remember, when we, if we start with the polynomial of degree n with zeros inside, we can find its Verblonsky coefficient, we can find the matrix. And it's a two-way path, right? Then actually explains why the eigenvalues determine the class. Because with eigenvalues using Sega recursion, we get uh, immediately the eigenvalues and, uh, and the other way around. So again, all those results uh, look so natural. We have the double parameterization of uh, the eigenvalues, or zeros, and the Verblonsky coefficient. We can play with that. So for instance, let me just uh, show very briefly the result, about the Poncelet type results, how they look from the point of view of orthogonal polynomials. So remember, we had this, right? The, the Gaon Wu, that numerical range of A is the intersectional numerical ranges. It essentially says the following. What you have here are zeros of your orthogonal polynomials. Uh, what you're having here on the circle are zeros of the orthogonal polynomials. And uh, basically, what you got here is just numerical range of your CMV matrix. And uh, the zeros here are exactly foci of this numerical range. So all this translation is just one to one is so natural from the point of view of polynomials, right? Um, so about the complete Poncelet curve, remember the, the guy inside? Uh, we discussed that, well, if we have a polygon, convex polygon, we actually have to look deeper, write all the diagonals, we'll see the whole complex curve. And this points, again, for side of this curve, right? And uh, for instance, a problem been discussed in literature and studied from several points of view. What if I give you uh, the for side of the curve, and I want to recover the curve? How can we do it? Well, there have been like competing schools. Uh, one approach is keep in hand. You can use keep in hand theorem. So you, you start with uh, foci, and you find a matrix representative of the class with eigenvalues exactly at this foci. And then, remember, keep in hand says, look at its numerical range. And that will give you at least the, the convex hull of the curve. That's one approach. A different approach was the school by Dab, Gorkin, Mirman, Fujimura, all other people that been saying, no, no, what you have to do is start with a Blaske product that vanishes at this point and solve this equation. For give different values of, of lambda on the unit circle, solve this equation. That's what we call uh, points identified by the Blaske product. Join them with polygons, you get your curve. And now, we came with this idea. No, what you have to do is use the paraorthogonal extensions. You just start with your polynomials vanishing at this point. Use Zegger recursion. You get all the paraorthogonal extensions on the unit circle. And join them, you get the curve. Now, natural question is, is it the same? 
or maybe one approach is subset of another one, fortunately the answer, they're all the same. They're totally equivalent. And in my point of view, the proofs are much more natural and easier using the orthogonal polynomials than the other two, but it's a matter of taste. Uh, so the theorem sounds more or less like this. So we start with a complete Poncelet curve of minimal class, because saying that, well, of course, you can artificially add some component, but then it doesn't apply. So it has to be a curve with the minimal class. And uh, all its real foci are inside the unit uh, disk, if and only if, well, this is what I said. It's a minimal class. In this case, it's totally de determined by the foci, the curve, as I said. And there are three equivalent realizations of the curve. One, as I said, is the envelope of the closed polygon supporting on the orthogonal extension. So apply Zeger recursion just next time using as a coefficient something on the unit circle. The second one is the Blaschke product. It's, well, we see now it's the same. It's no mystery why Blaschke product is there. It's actually rewriting the Zeger recursion the same. It just take your polynomial that vanishes here, write this Blaschke product, and solve the equation z times Blaschke product equal lambda on the unit circle. And again, it will be the envelope of the solution. And finally, as I said, well, let's uh, pay tribute to Kippenhahn. Take a matrix that has eigenvalues of these guys and look at numerical range. The good thing, you don't need to find a matrix. It's just your CMV matrix. Just take the CMV matrix uh, gi given by this uh, points. And this is the, the matrix that works for you, right? All three are the same. OK, a um, couple of more remarks. I still have some minutes, right? Um, for instance, very interesting. Remember this uh, addendum to uh, Darbu theorem about the ellipses, right? So if the numerical range is elliptic, what happens? So it's really curious to look at the case of elliptic numerical range and see what can we say. It's actually a little bit counterintuitive sometimes. At the beginning, well, if the matrix is 2 by 2 or if you're working with triangles, whatever you get, it's an ellipse. That's easy. What about the case a greater or equal than 3? So imagine you want to, use, you want to find a curve with 3 foci, so class uh, 3, but such that the numerical range is still an ellipse. My intuition initially was, oh, that's easy. Let's just make two of these three points coincide. You get at the end two points, essentially. That will be the curve. That is give what two foci. Well, doesn't work. And here you have an experiment. This, I just made two of them coincide. And this guy doesn't look like an ellipse. And actually, it's not an ellipse, right? So the right answer in this case would be this configuration, these three points that make give you an ellipse. So why, why that? So why this guy does give you an ellipse? And this does not. Darbu has the answer. It says, don't look, well, in general life, don't look at the exterior of the person. Look deep inside, right, the soul. The same with the algebraic curve. Don't look at the, look what is happening inside. And if you compare, uh, these are the difference. So in this configuration, the second component of the curve is not an ellipse. It's, a, it's not even, a, well, a degenerate ellipse will be a point. Only in this case, it's a point. And uh, knowing that, it's, we actually can, again, using the machinery we develop, we can write then uh, equations that allow us to figure out, for instance, problems. Like if I give you two points inside, find the third point that gives you like uh, elliptic, or we can go higher, right? Four points, I want to add another one that gives me elliptical in American range. So we can, this uh, like a, interesting uh, results. And it's a curious connection with Pell-Abel equations and also with Padet approximants, where we're still exploring. I'm not ready to report. But actually, we can characterize it somehow, apparently, in terms of Padet approximants. So at the end, the approximation theory is also here, right? So this is one thing that's been in progress. Uh, let me give you two more things that we are cooking. So for instance, billiards. Of course, you can look at this same problem from a point of view of dynamical systems. Instead of starting with a, from a curve inside, you can look more generally. Imagine you start from a point, and you have certain mapping that maps a point to a new point on the circle. 
tau. Imagine it's a, like a smooth differentiable mapping. And of course, you can start iterating it. And what if you know that after n steps, you go back, so it's a, it has a finite orbit, right? Since it's a general smooth mapping, you can start moving z, and you will start getting all these polygons. And you can ask yourself, what can I say about the curves that are tangent to all these polygons or envelopes? So for instance, if these polygons are not convex, can we get uh, convex curves? Well, obviously, yes, right? So non-convexity of the polygon doesn't mean this guy is not convex. However, for instance, we can, having on the opposite, right? So we have like convex polygons, triangles, and still they can draw something non-convex. So when is that? So we prove a theorem that says the characterization of that is that the argument of tau is uh, monotone. Essentially, it's uh, derivative, right? This kind of games we can play. There are much more. It's, so as I said, it's still, uh, oh, OK. Tau, it's a, a certain mapping. It's just a mapping that, uh, it's a function. So you, you pick your favorite function that maps a circle in the circle. And you can play this game, right? And, and see if you get something that is, uh, has a finite orbit. Of course, one way of defining mapping, you start with a curve inside, and you define it like a tangent. And then you play. But you can start just analytically, right? Pick your, OK. Um, Oh, I'm almost there. That's a nice thing we're exploring because it has a connection with, uh, with analysis also. It's about the Schwartz function. So the Schwartz function is uh, defined in, and uh, it's analytic function defined in neighborhood of any nice analytic curve given by this equation. So S of Z on the curve is given by Z bar. And here, one disclaimer is the Arnold principle applies. You know, the Arnold principle is a notion bears a personal name, then this name is not the name of the discoverer, right? By the way, I, the Arnold principle applies to itself, right? It's not that. <laughs> and uh, th in fact, these uh, functions were studied by uh, Studi, that was the, the first one, and Philip Davis has a nice book on that, that function, Grave, Herglotz, other people. And why is the connection? It turns out that in the case of numerical ranges, this uh, function can be continued inside analytically, except a finite number of branch points. Okay, and the good thing about the branch points are exactly for psi of your numerical range, or zeros of your orthogonal polynomial. So we have, if we could like write them in terms of Verblonsky coefficient, we would have like analytic definition of for psi of these curves, which is pretty nice, and we m probably can play with that. For instance, why this is important. If we consider uh, like integrals over or functions over the area inside numerical ranges, by green formula, we can reduce to this kind of integrals, which are complex integrals. Everything is deformable. We can deform it to sets that connect uh, branch points. And it has to do with so-called quadrature domains, Laplace and growth, mother body measures in a lot of very active areas. And, uh, Quadratic differential is my favorite topic, and so on and so forth. OK, this is just was the preview. I think it's time to wrap up. So the idea of the talk was to, to sell a little bit. It was a kind of a pitch that orthogonal polynomials on the unit circle are very natural framework to unifying, you, you know, like uh, operator theory, numerical ranges, Blaschke products, and the original work of Poncelé that I think it's really beautiful. Ponsolet spent two years in Russia. I think he learned some Russian, so maybe he could, I put his word, that he could say that. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, speaker. So we have a couple of minutes for the quick remarks and questions. So. Uh, maybe the uh, internet community has some questions. Nobody? Okay. I just, uh, uh, Andre, it's very nice, very nice uh, very talk nice. and very nice results. So, so just I want uh, to ask you mentioned this tower. If you use Blaschke product for this, uh, which you obtained in in your theory, what will happen? Yeah. Are there any the results? Yes. Of, of, of uh, again, 
I don't have a precise answer. Yes, this is something still in progress. We've been considering general results about uh, like characterizing when we have curves, for instance, convex, or when the curve is completely inside, because that was another thing that's not totally trivial. You say, I'm connecting uh, points on the circle, but still the envelope could get outside. We have several pictures. So we've been in that part. Now the next thing we want to, to study, as you said, so for Blaschke product, the natural uh, uh, candidate, right? Let's see, does it give us something specific and we characterize the type of curves we're getting? I don't know. That's a, that's a great question. Yes. Answer is I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, the best answer for me. Okay. So I, I would like uh, also to express uh, my uh, admiration of your wonderful talk. And <coughs> as uh, far I learned, uh, that uh, uh, the main uh, things here is that. Uh, Zero, so zero, so orthogonal polynomials. They are for psi for this algebraic curve, which yeah. works nicely with projective geometry and proves goes through C, uh, cutoff of C yeah. V matrix. Yeah. Who first uh, proved the theorem? Well, I think that was a work with Barry Simon and and uh, Brian Simak. That uh -huh. our paper. Yes. Excellent. Yes, and then others is just follows from yes. this. Uh, yes. Yeah, we're just continuing, yeah, because yeah, there yeah, are many yeah, natural yeah. questions. Uh, excellent, excellent. And my second uh, comment uh, for Russian air, yeah, it's nice sounds, but and him teams, particularly from the boy who was born in Soviet Union. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank and, you. And, and also got my, my <laughs> mathematics degree here, so I really appreciate it. Okay, so more questions, remarks? <coughs> Right. Yes. So, no. Okay, if. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, more, more remarks? No. Okay, then uh, let's uh, thank uh, the speaker for this very nice talk. So once again. Thank you.